Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate y'all coming, and uh, we're excited to share this. I, I, I'm excited as a trial lawyer about some of the, I know there are a bunch of great trial lawyers out in the room, but to have Nick Rowley, who everybody knows is a big time badass and a friend of mine, and Matt Morgan, who's gonna be talking, who is a stud in Orlando, who's John's son, who is gonna set the world on fire before it's all said and done. Rick Block, one of our partners who lives out here, is here, who is as good a lawyer as I've ever met in my life. And then, of course, Brian Panish, who we talk about great lawyers of our lifetime, but Brian Panish will go down as one of the great lawyers of all time. So I'm excited to have that kind of caliber and all the folks out there that I'm not calling their names. But so let me tell you, normally, those of you who know my book, I believe uh, deeply in systems, what I call systems that simply work, that can be plopped down in any case by any lawyer and gain benefit out of it, as opposed to some war story that, you know, wow, I'm impressed, but how am I ever going to use it? The problem today, because we are packed with so many people to speak, is I'm cutting some things short, and I honestly don't think I can do justice to going through a full system. So I decided there are some what I call gems, some real things that I believe can make a real difference and be powerful in a standalone fashion. And so I've just kind of got a list of some of these what I call highlights I just want to share in the limited time that I've got. And I want to start with a, a tool in cross-examination in, in a classic car crash case that I'm sure a bunch of you folks do. The car crash case that I'm talking about is the case where Someone didn't have trouble at all, let's say, in their neck, or didn't have it for five, ten years before this crash. They're in the crash. Immediately they got problems and they go to the emergency room. It's treated like a sprain strain. Everybody hopes it's going to go away, but they're having pain. It doesn't go away, so they start going to the chiropractor. That doesn't go away. They send them to have a, 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 see an, an MRI and see an orthopedic, and maybe a neurosurgeon, and maybe they try injections, and then they end up with a... a herniated disc diagnosis and either have surgery or at least have a recommendation for a surgery and they end up living for the rest of their lives with that pain that was thrust into their lives unnaturally. That's what I would call kind of the classic car crash case. And we all know the defense will hire one of these, we call them in Florida, CMEs. Uh, they're compulsory medical exams. I, I, I am sure y'all have them where they hire the same old doctors to say, it's all pre-existing, it's all, quote, degenerative disc disease, which is nothing but aging, but they make it sound like some horrible disease. Um, and they say, yeah, they had this sprain strain, and yeah, they were hurt in a crash, but just a teensy bit. And then they got better, you know, six weeks out. And now everything else got nothing to do with the crash. We, that's what I call a sensible sequence of events for us. There is a cross-examination that I can briefly share with you that I can tell you from having used it a bunch of times, there's no way out of it. And I know there's no way out because it's not like I sprung it for the first time. I use it, I've been using it for years, and I watch them squirm, and they have none of the defense lawyers that I come up against. They know what's coming, they can't fix it. So let me, let me share it with you. You got the doctor on the stand. And it's always helpful if you ask them in their deposition, are you suggesting my client was malingering? Don't say you're not suggesting my client was malingering because they're wired to disagree. They, yes, I am. But if you say, are you suggesting my client's malingering? Nine out of ten times they're going to go, no, because they think trap. He's trying to make me sound unreasonable. It's a trap. Now, once they say that, you have something extraordinarily powerful. In opening statement, I'm going to get to the cross, but this is a little bit of the setup. In opening statement, you can stand up and say, now folks, in a lot of these cases, people worry about, is the person exaggerating? Are they faking it? Well, I'm going to take that off your worry list. You don't need to worry about it in this case, because they've hired someone they hire all the time, they pay a lot of money to, to examine my client. The defense did. And one of the things he looks for is to see if they're faking or exaggerating. And he looked for it. And I'm telling you, because we've already taken his, taken his statement under oath, he concluded that my client was not, they had fancy words, malingering, which just means faking or exaggerating. 
So now that they've hired someone who's looked into that and concluded, no, we can take that off your worry list. Now, it, and hopefully these lawyers won't be suggesting it since their guy said no. But I don't know. I'm, we'll find out. And it just destroys them. But that's not the cross point. That's a setup for it. So now you're on cross and their guy comes in. Sir, let me see if I got this right. You would agree with me before this crash, and I mark a place in the room, and so just use yourself as a demonstrative aid. This is the point in the crash, and give the date. Now let's talk about what happened before that in your investigation. For 10 years before this, my client had no injections for her neck, no, no complaints about her neck, no MRIs on her neck, no suggestions for surgery on her neck, no doctor visits for her neck, nothing for 10 years. Can we agree to that? Well, that we were able to find. I said, sir, you understand you've got that big old box of records, and these people have subpoena power, and they've gathered and gathered, and you've looked at all. In fact, on direct exam, you stacked up all those records and showed the jury you looked at. There isn't a drop of ink in there about any of that before this crash with any problem with the neck. Isn't that a fact? Well, yes. Okay, good. Now, can we also agree that at the moment of this crash, my client started to have pain and went to the emergency room, and you say that pain was from an injury sustained in that crash when the defendant ran into him. You say it's just a little old sprain strain, but you agree he was hurt, and the hurting was being the pain was being caused by the hurt, it was caused by the crash. Can you agree with that? Uh, and you'll get a bunch of bullshit, but stay with it, and they're gonna have to say yes, because that is their opinion. They just didn't think it was gonna get packaged this way. Say, so, okay, so we know for 10 years before, nothing, 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 crash, pain from an injury in the crash. A sprain, strain, I said, I said that the first go around. That's what you say. Now let's talk about since then. Since then, you agree, your conclusion, you admit my client continued to have pain for six weeks. And during those six weeks, got injections. It makes me happy to see Nick Rowley smiling. I know I'm doing something right. Um, you got injections. You've got MRIs. You know all of this happened. During those six weeks, in fact, you say all of those treatments were reasonable, necessary, and related to the injury sustained in this crash, and I'll say it for you, that you call a sprain strain, right? Yes. Okay. So, let's see if I got this right. You're telling this jury for 10 years my client had none of those problems, was in this crash, was hurt in this crash, started to have pain that moment. Pain and an injury that required treatment for six weeks. But you're telling this jury at some point about six weeks out, my client went to bed with pain from an injury in the crash. According to you, it woke up the next morning with the exact pain. Only now, according to you, it's completely unrelated to the crash. Now it, the crash is all just a big coincidence. Do I have that right? Now you have all that ammo. It's just packaging. And I'll tell you what'll happen. I've just done it so many times. I don't understand. I say, okay. I love when they say I don't understand. You know what I do? I walk over here and march the shit off again. <laughs> After a couple marches, they don't say I don't understand. And I did it to some guy who's an old pro we get all the time. We got a great judge who retired I used to love, Judge Dickey over in, over in Sanford, Florida. Old country boy, could be hard, but he was smart and he was fair. And the other lawyer could not take it. The guy was ducking and weaving so bad, the lawyer said, Objection, Mr. Mitnick is badgering the witness that has been asked and answered. And old Judge Dickey goes, Well, I'll agree it's been asked a bunch of times, but it ain't been answered. <laughs> And the guy finally goes, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, it probably continued some as an aggravation. I went, I gotta bite him. Here we go. Normally, they just say, okay, that's what I'm saying. 
And in closing, you say, this guy says it's all just a big coincidence. By the way, don't say a coincidence. Coincidence happened. Say, all just a big coincidence. Now, people go, bullshit, just by adding a few little extra adjectives in there. So that's a strategy, tried and true, that will work on those guys where you have the, quote, sensible sequence of events. And let me, while we're on that, add another quick thing. Those experts in a car crash or a med mal case or any case, product where you're dealing with an expert, one thing we know, they don't pick an expert with, well, I've seen a few snaggletooth experts, but normally not. And normally they don't pick somebody with no credentials. And normally they don't pick somebody who can't communicate. They are slick, usually handsome or attractive, well-dressed, well-credentialed, hellacious talkers, and the jurors all by the time they're done with direct say, gosh, I'd like to buy him a cup of coffee. I love him. <laughs> well, that's a hell of a job to bring them down. Now, it's fun when you bring them from here to the down. But I got thinking, what if I, I, I can head them off at the pass? What if I can get at them before they get way up here? Maybe I can hold them here and it's just an easy trip. So, but you got to get in front of them before they dazzle them and charm them. So you do it in voir dire and opening. It starts in voir dire where you lay a little bit of a groundwork where you say, folks, you're gonna, one of the jobs you got to do is assess these expert witnesses with all this training and schooling you may not have. You're comfortable using your common sense getting to the bottom of who seems to be shooting more straight with me. Because, you know, look, they're paid. And being paid with one person may not impact them at all. They just let the chips fall where they may. They're, they're a reliable uh, guide to the truth. And others, look, the competitive spirit you know, starts to impact them. And all of a sudden, they become a paid persuader with an agenda. And one of your jobs is to kind of root that out. Is everybody comfortable using your common sense to figure it out? Are they evasive? They answer straight? Are they always arguing for their side? Or are they really just letting the chips fall where they may? Does everybody think they're up to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't really give a damn. It's not a real question. I'm setting it up for what's coming. Because some of what's coming, some of that you probably couldn't do in opening. It'd be too argumentative. Here's what you can do in opening. Now you get out in front of them. You can say, well, now I want to talk to you about this Dr. James. I almost said Jones. There's a Jones in Orlando. I'm going to be careful. We'll make it James. This Dr. James, the defense is going to call. Remember, we talked in Vordire about da 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 da. Well, let's talk about it because you're going to get to watch him. You're going to see if he's evasive. You're going to see this. Let me tell you what some of the evidence we know is coming about Dr. James. He's been paid X amount of money by the defense. He's worked with these lawyers you know, 25 times that we know of. He's going to be paid in this case $10,000 to $20,000 in this one alone. He works for the defense almost all the time, their side in a lawsuit. He's a guy that a big part of his income comes from being handpicked and paid by one side in a lawsuit. And guess which side it is? The defense. And if it's one of these rare ones that do 50-50, I say, he gets picked by one side other than the lawsuit, and it don't matter to him it's kind of which one is kind of first come, first serve. <laughs> so you take him through that. In opening, and then you add to it. Now, let me tell you what he's going to say. And you give him a little tidbit of that. He's going to tell you it's all just a big coincidence, even though she didn't have it before, she had it at the time. He's going to say about six weeks out, it just poof, went away. That's what he's going to, the evidence is going to show it's going to be his story. Now, let me tell you how you'll know when he gets here. The judge is going to say, call your next witness. And one of these folks over here at the defense counsel table is going to call Dr. James. And he's going to, the guy that's going to come in this beautiful suit, he's always got a beautiful suit, in this coiffed gray hair, perfect tie, real good talker. Man, does he have credentials. The guy that walks through the door that I've been talking about for the last five minutes is going to be the guy that comes through when they say, call your next witness. They say, we call Dr. James. That's him. Now, I tell you what will happen. Dr. James is going to come in, and they like the money, but they also like the adulation. And they're ready for all those jurors to go, oh, I love him. And when they're all going, they're like, is my zipper down? What the hell happened? 
And now your cross is a lot easier because you got out in front of it. So that's the, and one other, just a little thing on, on, while I'm on cross, just to throw in. Be careful of this. I catch my, I know better and I catch myself doing it. We never want to validate some hired expert who our position is they're lying through their teeth. Now we're careful. I like instead of calling them a liar is, look, if you've got someone you just killed, maybe you want to. But it, it's a higher bar than you need. I like, maybe he's a good man. And he's a certainly knowledgeable. He's gotten carried away by the competitive spirit. That's lowering the bar. It explains why he's not shoot, He's qualified to give you a straight answer. He's just not. But you don't have to say it's because he's a big fat liar, especially in a med mal case. A guy came down from Harvard just for 20 grand to lie to everybody. That's a hard sell. Carried away by the competitive spirit. He meets with the other side. They've studied up on it together. He's being paid by him. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of human nature. He'd like him to win. Sometimes you get carried away and they say things that in another setting you might hear something a little different. That's the kind of setup for it. But one of the phrases you got to be careful of is you'll say, now, nah, sir, I understand your opinion is, or I, I understand you believe. Wrong. You know what you're doing? You're validating it. You're making it sound like an honest disagreement. You're saying he really does believe it, and your position is, no, he's making it up. So it's very, if you're just careful, instead of saying you believe or your opinion is, you say, you say, you allege. Boy, the defense hates you allege. I get drugged to the bench on that all the time. Objection, Your Honor. You're saying allege like it's something criminal. I say, Judge, he is alleging. It's not, what are you talking about? I don't have to accept what he's saying. Yeah, that's stupid. I've never had a judge bite on the objection. And I love they run up and object to it. Or you can say, if you're a little more aggressive and he's a little more of a nasty expert, you can say, you would have the jury believe. But you say works well enough. Now, of course, if you're crossing some sweet little old lady who thought the red light was really green because she can't hardly see, you don't want to say, you allege. I mean, you know, it's got to fit. With her, you'd say, I understand, you would say so-and-so. That's a different witness. But with that witness who you really are suggesting they're not telling the truth, just be careful not to suggest they really mean it and we're just having a disagreement. All right, enough of the cross thing. Let me move to a whole nother subject. I assume y'all here in California have an aggravation of a pre-existing condition law, and I've never seen a state bidden. I've seen some states with some sorry laws, but that one most people have. Um, okay, you know when you come in a case and you're talking aggravation. One point before I move past, if you got someone with a clean neck, no problem, and they got a herniated disc, and they got a train wreck of a low back, they got, you know, 10 years of everything, then the defense has built a PowerPoint that's going to go on for days showing all the shit with their back, drop the back. You don't care where the money comes from. In that case, you don't need the aggravation, either personal aggravation or aggravation of a pre-existing condition. And you'll destroy their opening when you get, I never tell them I'm going to do it, I just get up and open. Say, so now by the way, my client had no problems with the neck, they hit it, have all these problems, had surgery. Now, I will tell you, my client had a low back problem that she's had all kind of stuff with, all kind of problems, a lot of treatment. But, and you're going to hear from the doctor that treated her, not someone hired, just someone treating, that it was aggravated in the crash, made worse. And under the law, we're entitled, we have a right to pursue that. But we're not going to, because your job's hard enough here. So to simplify your job, I'm not going to be talking about that. We're only going to be talking about what's fair and reasonable for it was taken from her in the way of health with her neck. Now, the defense can't help them. And I'll say, I end with. Now, they've got, they, the defense, if they want to bring out all the back stuff, they can. I don't know why they would, since we're not talking about it. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it because we're not, in, and I'm respecting your time. Now, when they get up and put the PowerPoint, you can see the jury going from, wow, this person's a wreck and they want all this money. They're like, what the hell? I want to get to lunch. Why are you talking about the back? It just destroys their plan. And they'll always shortchange the neck because they were planning on putting their emphasis on the back. So having said that, we all have cases where it is an aggravation case. That's your injury. 
So we can't just drop it or you'd dismiss the case. So what do we do with an aggravation case? Here's the best that I've come up with, and I know it works because this is one of those been, I've done a bunch. You explain to the jury aggravation, pre-existing, all that. But then you use this phrase. And I start this in jury selection. We have something called as is just, I call as is justice. Meaning you take the person as they are with whatever health problems they got. The fancy word is equal justice or justice for all. I just like to call it as is justice is a little simpler. But what it means is you don't have to be a perfect specimen of health in the prime of your life as an 18-year-old to get justice. People that got some mileage on them, a little wear and tear, maybe some health problems, maybe they had some other injuries in their life. They can get justice too. It's actually so important that our state has a law that specifically protects those people who had problems before that were made worse so they can get justice too. They're not left on the sideline in this hall of justice. It's called aggravation of a pre-existing condition. And I will promise you one thing before this case is over. We're going to prove to you my client qualifies under that law. My client has a pre-existing condition. If they deny it, I will cross-examine this doctor we talked about, and I promise you he'll end up admitting it. My client qualifies. She had a pre-existing injury. Now, I mean, I'm telling you what they do in opening is they're whispering, what the hell? That was our fact. And then they spend half their time trying to say, let me tell you what, that's really good for us. Wah, wah. And they're off their game. And I'll tell you what else happens. All your grown-ups are thinking, God damn it, I better be able to get justice myself. I mean, I'm sitting here, my shit's hurting, I understand. You telling me if someone rams me, I can't get justice? So it is a little golden rule-ish, and it's powerful. By the way, just on that, my back hurts, I'm sitting in the stool, no one gave me money, we all live and worry with that. Here's the, I'm not saying this is the be-all, end-all, but it helps. I always use the phrase when talking about my client's injury, thrust into her life unnaturally. And there's, if there's no comparative thrust in her life unnaturally by no fault of her own, she was on the road that day minding her own business. When the defendant came along not doing their job on the road that day, endangering the motoring public, and rammed her from behind and thrust this into her life for the rest of her life unnaturally by no fault of her own. Thrust into life unnaturally is almost biblical. And it, it's almost sinful. God damn it. And you separated yourself from the people who just, God, my back, I'm getting older, my back hurts. They're thinking, boy, this is miserable. No one gave me money, but if it had been thrust into my life unnaturally, they better back up a Brink's truck. So it gives you a little distance from the aches and pains of your jurors. Um, all right, here's another one. Letters, do y'all have letters of protection here where we call them that in Florida, where the doctor, some doctors will treat the patient, say, I'll wait to get paid from the money? Liens, all right, same thing. We call them letters of protection. Uh, I've, I've struggled with what's a good way to deal with those. Um, I, I will say this. I don't believe it fits void dire. It's too case specific. You're going to put a red spotlight on a subject that you don't want to talk about, and then you're going to get questions about, well, it depends. Um, you know, what are the, how much is the doctor, and what, how many times is it? You can't answer it, and then your judge is going to shut you down. And then you're going to have raised it and left a stinker in the room with nothing, no cause challenge come out of it. So I don't touch it, but I do an opening. And it's this simple. I say, now, some of y'all may be concerned that how do we know on these past medical expenses that they're really going to go to the doctor as intended if we were to find yes for this amount? Because the doctor's name isn't on the verdict form. So how do we know it's actually going to end up where we were intending it to go? Well, you don't need to worry about that in this case because my client has entered into a written enforceable contract with the doctor that guarantees if you find that, that's where that money's going. So you got plenty of things to worry about. You don't need to worry about that anymore. And it's got a name. It's called a lien. And we're going to put it into evidence and show it to you. So there's no question. She has agreed to do the honorable right thing. And I really think that takes a lot. Again, they'll get up and try and squirrel around and turn it into bad, but you know, there's, it's hard to 
get a change that first impression. You don't get a second chance first impression. It's the beauty of us getting to go first. Um, let me give you a little slip and fall. I assume I, I would say raise hands with these damn bright lights. I can't hardly see anybody past the first two rows. I assume we got plenty of folks who do slip and fall, trip and falls. All right. Here's a couple things, little gems on, uh, tr let's separate trip and fall, slip and fall. Let's use the grocery store, the business, has something slick on the floor, your client goes down and the defense is, there wasn't anything there. They just deny there was anything to slip on the floor. Closing argument, and you could work it in earlier. Um, it is likely, a reasonable inference in this case, and when my client was two, three years old, she was starting to walk, she wasn't really good at it, fell a lot. She started to get better as she got more experience. When she got up about six, she's a pretty good walker unless she went around a corner too fast, she'd still go down. Time she got in high school, she was really experienced at this walking thing and good. <laughs> Time she got into her 20s, 30s, really getting it down, down, down pat. <laughs> now she's 50. She's one of the most experienced walkers <laughs> in this country. Now they would have you believe on this day, she suddenly forgot how to walk and spontaneously fell to the ground. Or just maybe there was something slick on the floor, you decide. And they laugh every time. And when they laugh, you go, I can check that off my worry list. Um, here's a trip and fall. Matt Morgan and I just tried a case. Our lady tripped on a sidewalk. Thank, in Florida, we have sovereign immunity for cities. Thank God this was in a business area, so it was privately owned sidewalk. And there were tree roots that typical pushed up the sidewalk. But it pushed it up so damn high. I mean, it was like four inches up, and this thing happened in broad daylight. And we had a good injury. They denied it, but she hit her face, broke some bones, and severed the nerve, the olfactory nerve that affects your smell, so you can't smell. And I found out, if you can't smell, like it takes away 90% of your taste. So everything tastes like cardboard. So I had no problem asking for millions of dollars. I'm like, God almighty, if I couldn't taste? So, I like, now they denied it. They said she didn't break her bones, she didn't hurt her nerve, and she's making up, she can't smell. But, that wasn't my concern. My concern is the open and obvious, because this damn thing was as open and obvious I've ever seen. And we designed a strategy that worked so well, I am convinced you can try that case and have a high probability of getting zero comparative by just applying this. First thing is in Vordire, you always cover. How many of you feel if someone uh, slips and falls, trips and falls, they must be at least partially at fault, no matter what the evidence shows, is, uh, period. You're just telling us you already made up your mind on that part automatically. You trip and fall, you gotta have some fault. I couldn't bring back a verdict, in all honesty, that said zero. And those people gotta go for cause. So, and you're honestly not gonna change your mind on it. That's your best honest answer, yes. Now you've gotten rid of the ones this wouldn't have worked on. On the other people, here was the simple strategy. I gotta make it clear to you folks, this is what's called an affirmative defense. This blaming my client saying she should have seen it is on them. All this talk about burden of proof, it's their burden. They gotta prove to you what, more likely than not. But let's talk about what they gotta prove and what they don't, what won't work. It's not enough for them to prove she could have seen it. It's not enough to say someone else might have seen it. It's not enough she could have taken steps to avoid it. That is not meeting their obligation to you. They have to prove to you, my client did something wrong. My client acted unreasonably. And she's not walking through a garbage dump looking at broken glass. And human beings don't walk looking at their feet. That's dangerous. They walk up. Now you could walk up and see that if your eyes were on it at the right moment as you were approaching. But, and we had a human factors expert type person who explained the difference between conspicuity and visibility. And the difference is, can you see it? Yes. Conspicuity means, but there's a constant 
competition for attention. Bird go by, motorcycle, car, tree, whatever. People are human beings look around at different things unless they're in a dangerous alert situation. That's why you paint it with exciter colors so that wins in the competition, which they hadn't. So we know she's just being a human being if she's not happened to looking down at that moment. Now, had she been on her cell phone texting, maybe. Had she been walking backwards, maybe. Had she been doing this, yep, I'd give them that. But she would do none of that. And they suggest she was on her phone talking. The phone records show she wasn't, but who cares? Are we going to say everybody going to lunch today better not talk to the companion they're with? You, or you're doing something wrong. Being on the phone's no different. There's nothing wrong with it. So please bring back a verdict that says, A, these people didn't do their job right, and they had ample time. They had two years from when they heard about it. They didn't even put pain on it. And please bring back a verdict that says, my client did nothing wrong. Nothing. And lastly, a verdict that recognized the magnitude of what was taken from her in the way of hell. And they were out 45 minutes. We got a million five which I frankly thought was bullshit, it was too low, but we were still happy. Because they offered, I think, 35 grand or something, and zero comparative. And it was just the recognition of, wait a minute, it's not about could you see it? It's about did she do something wrong? And in that setting, there's nothing wrong with not staring at your feet. So that's slip and fall, that's Trip and fall. Where's my little timer? Someone told me I had a timer up here. Oh, I see it. Okay, I got 13 minutes. Let me, I'm going to skip a couple things here. Well, let me give you this. And then I want to do a couple of analogy things and we'll be done. Um, Matt and I tried a couple cases recently. And I want to tell you, if I've got a memo. I, I'm, I, I, this is too extensive. It'll eat up my whole time. And I'm going to give you a couple highlights. If you want a copy of a memo, it, I'm so excited about it. I did a memo inside the office. If you send an email to me at K Mitnick, it's M I T N I K, don't put a C here, I won't get it. K Mitnick at forthepeople.com, F O R, not the number for it. K Mitnick at forthepeople.com. And say, hey, um, thanks. Uh, you said you had some memo on belittling pain, putting an end to belittling pain, you can't see. You can just say belittling pain. I'll know what it is. And I will forge all that, the memo. But let me just give you a couple highlights from it. It's all about framing. We tried these two cases back to back, and they were identical. It was just bizarre how, how similar they were. Um, and it was that same classic example, except on top of the sequence of events, both our clients were young, both of them treated for a little bit, then quit treating, basically. Both of them had surveillance that didn't catch them lying at anything. By the way, I've got a strategy. If your client says, I can't, and they show them on video they can, I got a strategy works every time. I wasn't going to cover it. Do you all want to hear it? Okay. Get another case. Get another case. You can't win. You can't win that one. But if I ever figure that one out, I'm retiring. I'm going to patent it and retire. But this is the case where the surveillance just made them look so damn healthy. The case couldn't be worth a lot of money. One of them, the guy was unloading boxes out of a U-Haul. He had this big old guy, and he was a kind of slight guy. And the big guy never touched a box. And our guy unloaded every damn box. There must have been 50 of them. And he acknowledged they didn't have video of it, but it didn't matter. He said, I'm an assistant coach for the football team, and my, I work with the ends. So he's throwing the football to the ends all day. And we're talking about a neck case that we're, gonna, we're asking for $5 million on. Um, and the other guy was, they got video mowing the biggest damn lawn I've ever seen mowed. I'm saying, get you a riding mower, buddy. I mean, it was huge. And he's pushing this thing around. And they videoed all, it was like painful. It went on. A, then he went in the garage. Of course, his damn garage is up. And he lays down on weights. And I thought he was going to, he lifted him, he put him down. Then he pulled himself up. And he said, and I believed him, that he stretches like that after he's mowing because he's hurting. 
Except you know they're thinking, what the hell, you got the weight bench in there anyhow. You didn't have any children. Um, so we have all those facts. We tried those cases back to back. I mean, we got a verdict on Friday. We walked in front of the same judge, and you couldn't tell the difference of those cases if you tried. And we picked the, the, another jury on Monday, got a verdict the next Friday. Same judge, same courtroom, everything. And, and we got, I'd say, a million on both. One was nine, one was a million one, so I averaged it. It's a million on both. And out of it, we designed some stuff. I realized, I knew it for years. I've tried those cases many times. I've just never done them back to back where you really have some of these epiphanies. And how we've got to design around, my client looks fine. And how are we going to convince them this is a big case? And I'll give you a couple of the pieces of it. I promise you there's a lot more. I'll send it to you in the memo. But here's a couple of them. One of them is, I vore dire, the worry about my client looking fine. And I said, look, my client's looking, I got something I got to ask you about, I'm concerned about. My client's sitting over there and looks fine. We're not allowed to lay out the evidence of what's going on inside. We've all heard of you can't judge a book by its cover. But I'm concerned if my client were to show any sign of pain and move a little, that y'all are going to think he's putting on for us. And if he sits there still like I told him to do, I'm afraid y'all are going to say, boy, he sure don't look hurt to me. Can all of y'all be aware there's just no good answer to that and just wait soon enough, we're going, I'm going to be doing an opening statement and will tell you all about what's going on inside. We're going to open the book up. Can you resist the natural inclination to start prejudging? You could see jurors go from, mm, you got me there, okay. I mean, you could, I've never seen, this one of the few things I've done where it was so obvious that everybody, there were a bunch of them doing it and they realized it wasn't fair and I believe they quit. They quit. I know the ones that sat on our jury quit doing it. So that's one of them. And the rest was just coming up with some words and phrases for jurors in analogy to make jurors understand. Here's one. Pilot light pain. I said it's, it's what people often call pilot light pain. Now, I made it up, but they don't. I mean, who the hell's going to prove that it, that it had been going on for years? I said um, it's what's often called pilot light pain. The reason they call it pilot light pain is because Everyone's seen, you know, a gas stove, a furnace, where you got that little pilot light that's always there flickering. And that's how his pain is. And just like the gas stove, then you can turn it up and it can blaze when he overdoes. But then it'll go back down, but it never goes away. He lives with it all the time. It's like background noise irritating him. It's there all the time. It's not cane pain. Meaning, he doesn't need a cane to get around. It's not that kind of pain. It's pilot light pain. It's the kind of pain that interferes not so much with the doing. See, I'm taking away those, those surveillance films. It's the kind of pain that doesn't interfere so much with the doing as it does with the experience of doing. You can still go to a movie and enjoy it. But if you've got a crick in your neck, it's a different experience because it's there being distracting. You can go to church and get a good sermon, but you're in a hurry to get out of the pew and get out of there so you can move a little. So it's the kind of pain, this pilot light pain, that interferes not so much with the doing as it does with the experience of doing. But here's the truth and what the evidence shows, is this is as good as it's going to get. And over the years when wear and tear and old age starts laying on top of those damaged links in my client's spine that are never going to be undamaged, it's just going to get worse. The worst is yet to come. And before too long, it's going to start interfering with the doing too. And you have to remember, this is a verdict for all time. We don't come back in five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We had long life expectancy. And do updates. We get it right now or we don't get it right at all. And then I'll give you a quick analogy. Say, it's like if somebody goes to bed and the guy wakes up in the morning, he slept wrong, got a little crick in his neck. And he grumbles a little. His wife said, what? He says, I slept wrong, got a crick in my neck. Well, I'm sorry, honey, no problem, no big deal. He goes to pick up his briefcase, he feels it. He gets in the car, goes to change lanes, and feels it when he looks in his blind spot. He gets to work, he sits, he can't stay comfortable. He stands, it helps a bit, and he's back with it, bothering him a bit. He sits, stands, drives home, all the same stuff. Gets home, wife says, how are you? I'm all right, this, you know, I, this thing's really irritating me, but she says, maybe you ought to go to the doctor. And he says, no, it's not that kind of injury, not that kind of thing. Okay. 
goes to bed, gets up the next morning, moans. What? I was hoping to be gone. Same thing all day long, picking up, sitting, all, the, all that same routine. He's living with it. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't call in sick. It's not that kind of pain. You know what else he doesn't do? He doesn't walk around going, ow. People say, you big baby, get a grip. Nobody at work knows. They don't have a clue. It's not that kind of pain. His wife knows. They have an intimate relationship. But now it's starting to grate on his nerves. He's getting in a bad mood. He drives home that day, walks in the door short with the kids. Wife says, what's the matter with you? I'm sorry, this thing's really getting on my nerves. Well, you need to go to the doctor. Now it's a little less about poor honey and more about I don't want to crank in the house. He gets up the next morning. Wife's in brushing her teeth. And he goes, hallelujah. She goes, what? He goes, it's gone. Well, this kind of pain my client has that's never going away but is not interfering so much, no one would know looking, is just like that, except there is no hallelujah ever. You know what happens? Every juror that's over 15, and I doubt you'll have a 15-year-old in your jurors, has had a crick in their neck. And every one of them is thinking, God damn it, if that never went away and someone did it, thrust it in my life unnaturally, you'd have to back a Brink's truck up. That's a big deal. So that's a shadowing, a, a, a preview of some of this stuff that came out of the belittling pain. And we know it worked because it's just the same exact case. We didn't do magic. We did smart. And it made all the damn difference. And I got three minutes left, and I'm going to end with just a little under the analogy stuff is... Power analogy is so important. It's so important. It's how people understand things they can't under, they, they have no personal experience with. So it, rather than use analogies just in kind of intuity, I, intuitively, I suggest you use them as a tool to prepare for trial to deal with things. And I got a whole section in the book on it, and I wish I had more time because there's some potent stuff in there, but I don't. But I'll just give you one, a couple quick examples. One. You got someone where the other side gets caught lying a bunch. Let's say you got their expert and you just really tore them up some. You can use little analogies to truly bring that home to the jury. Say, look, the truth is like in a courtroom, is like an air bubble that gets stuck under a rock. It just finds a way to the surface, particularly under cross-examination in a courtroom. And under cross-examination to Dr. Smith, there were so many of those little truth bubbles bursting, it was like a jacuzzi in here. <laughs> and they'll all laugh. And again, you go, we're in business. And the last one, in the, my last two minutes, is we've all had those cases where the defense just, it, it's like defense lawyer porn. They can't wait to show the pictures of the bumper that's got a scratch on it to suggest the person can't have been hurt badly. I got a model for that that I promise you, you will still can lose a case with, a bat, with those pictures. You won't lose over those pictures. If your client's caught lying 15 times, you can still lose. But this will take care of the, the, the photo problem. It starts with picking the right words. Don't say low impact, that's their game. That means, low impact means it wouldn't hurt a flea. Say, not a lot of visible property damage, why? Because if there's not a lot of visible property damage, A, it's neutral, and B, a lot of people put their car in the shop after a, 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 some kind of crash and never ran the same. So it taps into, it's not all, there's more there than meets the eye. It could be more to it. Then, after you've done that, in Vordire, how many of you think if someone doesn't have, if the, there's not a lot of visible property damage, the person can have been hurt badly, certainly not permanently, no matter what the doctors say and the evidence shows? That's a cause challenge. Those people love that photo porn of the bumper. We want to get them out. So now what's left? Here's a little short story and an analogy that brings it all the way home. And I have no chair. We'll pretend, we'll pretend there's a chair sitting here. And if there was just perfect, thank you. Jury's you. You set a chair like this with nobody in it. Starts with a little story and then it ends with this analogy. Story. 
I don't know why it is little kids love this game of sneaking up on one another and shoving them in the back unexpectedly, especially them little boys. I bet you right now there are boys on playgrounds across this country sneaking up on his buddy, shoving him hard. He goes down, he jumps up, brushes off, and chases him across, squealing, and they all laugh. Grown-ups don't sneak up on one another unexpectedly and shove them in the back. Why? Because someone's going to get hurt. Because our necks aren't subtle like those little kids. It's like, and here comes the analogy, if someone was sitting in this chair and they had no idea I was coming and I was across the room and by all accounts the crash was, you know, 5, 10 miles an hour, I don't know how fast that would be running on my feet, but I bet I'd be getting it. Now, I am not going to run like a fool across this courtroom in my suit and shoes. But if I did, and that person had no idea I was coming, and I was going 5 to 10 miles an hour, and I went, and they went, ow, what are you doing that hurt? How fair would it be for me to say, what are you talking about? That couldn't have hurt. There's not a mark on the chair. It wouldn't be fair at all. Why? Because it's not about the mark on the chair. It's about the unexpected jarring from behind that causes injuries in grown-ups. And it's over. And I just, before I finish, say why the little lead-in story was so important. Because when you tell the little kids in the playground, every grown-up on that jury, when you say grown-ups don't sneak up on one another and shove them in the back unexpectedly, cringe. They think, God, I would kill this son of a bitch. <laughs> and as soon as they cringe, you got them. Because now they're experiencing it from your client's shoes. Then you drop that analogy on them and let them drag those pictures out. Thank you.